this year said, quote, the vibrant national economy is enticing more of the state's residents to seek opportunities elsewhere. The main reason for the worsening trend is a loss of domestic residents or people moving from Illinois to other parts of the United States. In the past few years, the gap has widened as an underperforming Illinois economy has reduced the state's appeal compared with the rest of the country. And that report was issued before the pandemic. More recently than that, the State Chamber of Commerce released a report which cautioned that the tax hike would be even more harmful under today's climate. That report said that rather than eliminate jobs from a relatively strong economy that might have been capable of quickly replacing them, the proposed graduated income tax will now result in job losses that will further weaken an already weak economy. Now remember that we lagged the nation in our recovery from the Great Recession and will likely lag the nation once more as we recover from the pandemic and the economic fallout caused by it and the subsequent shutdown of the economy. Illinois in the past has been dubbed the worst state to be a taxpayer. We've been referred to as the least tax friendly state. We have the highest overall state and local tax burden in the nation, including among the highest property taxes and now the third highest gasoline tax. And as if we could forget, the Census Bureau reminds us that for the sixth consecutive year, Illinois' population declined more than any other state. In fact, over the last decade, Illinois shrunk more than any other state. And it's no wonder why. As I always say, Illinois is at the top of every list we ought to be at the bottom of. We're at the bottom of every list we ought to be at top. But it, it shouldn't be this way. By all rights, Illinois ought to be one of the most prosperous states in the union, but for bad public policy. You know, at the same time, we have 36 Fortune 500 companies headquartered here. And as I like to remind audiences in more suburban areas of the state, over 75% of Illinois is covered by farmland. Our industrious farmers feed the world. I'm sure we have some farmers on the call this evening. I was just on a, uh, my, 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 my uh, meeting prior to this was, was with uh, Representative Bailey down in Southern Illinois. He said uh, that their, uh, their harvest is already underway. You know, we've been blessed with abundant natural resources. And if Illinois were a standalone country, our economy would be among the top 20 on the globe. Yet despite all of this, we're the laughing stock of the nation. And I believe, and I'm sure you do too, that Illinois must reclaim its rightful place as the economic engine of the Midwest, but entrusting our chronically fiscally irresponsible legislature with expanded powers to tax us all is not the solution. Now, as long as Illinois has had an income tax, which by the way has only been for 25% of our time as a state, but as long as we've had an income tax, it's been flat. In fact, the promise of a flat income tax is enshrined in the Illinois Constitution. Article 9, Section 3 of the Illinois Constitution states very simply that a tax on or measured by income shall be at a non-graduated rate, full stop. So this whole conversation that we'll likely see a hundred million dollars spent on it when all is said and done is over just those few words in the Constitution. Now a word about the amendment itself. The amendment itself does not include rates. Rather, it merely asks the good people of the great state of Illinois to bless the notion of a graduated income tax, leaving the minor details like rates and brackets at the discretion of Springfield politicians who, with a simple majority vote, could change them at any time. It would also make taxing retirement income easier by removing the requirement that there be only one tax on income. The amendment would allow the legislature to set the rate or rates on quote unquote any tax it sees fit to implement. And our state treasurer recently acknowledged this when he said, quote, one thing a progressive tax would do is make clear you can have graduated rates when you are taxing retirement income. And interestingly, every state with a graduated income tax taxes retirement income. Also left on the cutting room floor between the time that the amendment was introduced and the time the amendment was adopted was a constitutional prohibition against local 
income taxes. And it's also worth noting that the opposition to the amendment was bipartisan in the state house until the uh, sole dissenting Democrat uh, from Southern Illinois resigned uh, from the legislature in order to uh, accept a position within the Pritzker administration. And he is now the state's director of uh, agriculture, I believe. Now it's also important to recall who is asking for more tax power. And we need look no further than what the legislature did this spring when politicians, despite Representative Swanson's objections and the objections of some of his uh, fellow caucus colleagues, uh, when they passed an unbalanced budget that didn't include any cuts and that pinned its hopes on a federal bailout. In fact, despite a constitutional requirement that the state budget be balanced, we've only had a balanced budget one time this entire century. And if you've been following current events as of late, some of these headlines may sound familiar to you. FBI agents conduct apparent raid at Illinois Capitol. A state lawmaker has been wearing a wire for FBI. State representative charged with offering bribe to fellow lawmaker. Former Illinois state senator pleads guilty to federal bribery. We all know about the unpleasantness regarding Commonwealth Edison and, the, and their acknowledgement that they have uh, participated in a years long bribery scheme and agreed to pay an unprecedented $200 million fine. Uh, and in that agreement with the federal government, uh, Speaker Madigan was named as public official A. And an Illinois state senator has been charged with and just yesterday pled guilty to federal income tax fraud. Now, when he was charged with felony income tax fraud, his first act was to resign from the Legislative Ethics Commission. And again, he pled guilty in federal court yesterday. So a lawmaker, a politician who voted for a massive tax hike was hiding his own income from the government in order to avoid paying taxes. It reminds me of the Teddy Roosevelt quote, when they call the roll in the Senate, the senators do not know whether to answer present or not guilty. So it seems to me that now is a particularly bad time for Springfield politicians to be asking voters to trust them. For heaven's sake, after Rod's recent homecoming, we as Illinoisans were without a former governor in federal prison for the first time in over a dozen years. So again, we need to ask ourselves a question, how have taxpayers been treated in the past? In 2011, the temporary income tax hike uh, vote occurred in the middle of the night on the last day of a lame duck session. In fact, 20% of the vote for that tax hike came from lame duck lawmakers who were no longer accountable to the voters. In 2017, the vote to permanently raise the income tax occurred over the Independence Day weekend, as you and most other Illinoisans were enjoying backyard barbecues and fireworks. And the vote last year to double the gasoline tax occurred as, a la as part of a last minute deal cobbled together in a matter of days. Now, we can also look to this very issue and how it unfolded when Governor Pritzker unveiled the constitutional amendment in early April last year, the Senate immediately voted to waive the posting requirement and it was heard in committee the following day. An amendment containing the rates, a 64 page amendment containing the rates was filed one spring afternoon last year at around 2.30 in the afternoon and it was immediately assigned to a 2 p.m. committee. Now it tends to be true that when things happen quickly or quietly in Springfield, taxpayers lose. And keep in mind that votes to approve rates only take a simple majority. Now, constitutional amendments have been filed in both chambers, and I believe Representative Swanson is a sponsor of that amendment in the House uh, to require a two-thirds supermajority to increase taxes. But you can imagine where those proposals have gone. Now, over the course of the last decade, because of those twin massive income tax hikes, Illinoisans have forfeited an additional $54 billion above and beyond what we would have paid otherwise in state income tax. And yet some politicians are asking you to believe that this time with this tax hike, unlike in 2011 and unlike, in 2000, unlike 2017, things will be different. 
Now, just to give you an idea of, of state income taxes by the numbers, nine states have no income tax. An additional nine states have a flat tax, meaning that more than a third of all the states have either a flat state income tax or none at all. And as I mentioned, uh, we are now the sixth most populous state. So what about those five states that are larger than us? What about our peers by size? Well, two states that are larger than us have no income tax and Pennsylvania has a flat tax. So uh, what about our neighbors, our neighboring states? Well, Michigan has a flat tax. Indiana has a flat tax. Kentucky has a flat tax. Missouri, for all intents and purposes, has a flat tax because the highest tax bracket there kicks in at something like $5,000. Iowa has recently cut taxes and Wisconsin has recently cut taxes. And recently the trend across the nation has been a shift away from progressive taxation. In 2011, Utah switched to a flat tax. In 2014, North Carolina followed suit. And most recently our neighbor Kentucky did likewise in 2018. And in uh, Colorado and Massachusetts of all places, voters have rejected ballot initiatives to implement a graduated income tax there. In fact, the last state to implement a graduated income tax was Connecticut in the 1990s. And just a few years ago, the Democrat governor of Connecticut said, quote, I've raised taxes multiple times. It's not working and it's come up a cropper. Now, for those of you who like me uh, don't know what that term means, I had to look it up, but apparently it means a massive failure. Now, one of the things you're hearing quite a bit and you're seeing quite a bit, whether, you're, whether it's television, uh, on the computer, or uh, you're likely uh, receiving mail about this already, but one of, the, one of the main claims of the proponents is that 97% uh, of people will pay the same or less. Their claim is that if you make, if you earn less than $250,000 a year, you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Now, the introductory initial rate schedules proposed by the governor and approved by the legislature uh, over bipartisan opposition, by the way, do appear to ostensibly provide tax relief to the vast majority of Illinoisans, but that's only true when compared to the current rate, because you'll notice that nobody would be paying less than we were paying just a few years ago prior to the 32% income tax hike from 2017, meaning that politicians had to raise your taxes in order to pretend to lower them. And keep in mind that votes to approve rates, to increase the rates, can happen at any time with a simple majority vote. Now, initially accepting this promise of paying the same or less in exchange for handing the legislature a blank check with the likelihood of higher taxes in the future is a bad deal for middle-class families. And people often ask me, how is it that I'm so confident that this will begin to affect the middle class? Well, 80% of all taxpayers in Illinois earn less than $100,000 a year. There is twice as much income reported by Illinoisans earning less than $250,000 a year than there is income reported by Illinoisans making more than $250,000 a year. Those people who will immediately see a tax hike. So when, when proponents want more money, where are they going to have to go to get it? They're going to have to come to the middle class. You know, during the depression, somebody once famously asked the bank robber, Willie Sutton, why he robs banks. And he replied, because that's where the money's at. And here in Illinois, the money is in the middle. And it's likely that politicians would, and potentially almost immediately, begin tinkering with the initial introductory rates by adding rates, adding brackets, and reducing the threshold at which higher rates apply. And how this very issue unfolded illustrates that concern. The plan passed by the legislature, which as I mentioned, uh, had bipartisan opposition, raised the top rate and lowered the threshold at which it applied uh, between the time when it was introduced and the time it was voted on. And it's reasonable to be concerned that this pattern will only continue and soon affect the middle class. And the rate schedule that the legislature adopted would give Illinois the highest corporate income tax in the nation, but it would also be, as one columnist noted, particularly ungenerous to the poorest Illinoisans because proponents of the amendment speak of fairness 
in remedying regressivity, but the rate schedule that the legislature passed would give Illinois one of the highest, lowest tax brackets in the country. Over 50% of all states with a graduated income tax have a lowest bracket of 2% or less. But the governor wishes to tax your very first dollar at a mere fifth of a percent less than you currently pay. And that's just where we'd start with absolutely no guarantees that taxes won't begin to rise on the middle class. One academic proponent of progressive taxation raised concerns that the governor's rate schedule was, quote, severely flawed and would have serious negative consequences. Now, during the debate on the three and a half billion dollar tax hike, one colleague of Representative Swanson's stated outright that he did not think that these initial introductory rates were high enough. Some politicians and organizations backing the tax hike amendment have advocated for raising taxes on those who earn far less than $250,000 in the past, which seems to suggest to me that there's an appetite for raising taxes higher than these initial introductory rates that were being shown. Now, having put our state at a competitive disadvantage because of poor public policy on many fronts, the predictability and the certainty provided by a flat state income tax is practically one of the only bright spots on the Illinois tax horizon. Now, conversely, with a graduated tax scheme comes increased complexity, decreased predictability. And whenever a tax system becomes more complex, the wealthy and the well-connected benefit because they're the ones who can afford the attorneys and the accountants and the lobbyists to go and lobby for loopholes and carve outs and exemptions. In fact, here in Illinois, we have a wonderful example already of an incredibly complex tax code, our property taxes. And we've seen the lengths that the wealthy and the well-connected will go to in order to avoid paying their property taxes. This is why at the federal level, it was so difficult uh, uh, to, uh, reform the federal tax code, as was done in 2017 with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, because lobbyists that had successfully uh, 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 gotten carve-outs and loopholes and exemptions written into the tax code on behalf of their clients over 30 years didn't want to give those up. They built up in the tax code like barnacles on a ship's hull, and it was incredibly difficult in order to reform the way the federal tax code works. Now, Again, as I mentioned, we've had a flat tax for as long as we've had an income tax, uh, which was first passed uh, immediately prior to the, uh, to the 1970 Constitutional Convention. And then there at that convention, the delegates debated the merits of a, a graduated income tax versus a flat tax. And of course, they opted to write into the Constitution this requirement that the tax be flat. In fact, at the convention, one of the delegates stated, quote, if I read them, meaning the people of Illinois, if I read them correctly, they would like and almost demand a limitation placed on the income tax. The thought being that we were told that the federal income tax was not to exceed, I believe, 4%. While there is no need to belabor that point, we know where that went, and I think people are fearful. Now, while that delegate was off by a few percentage points, his concern was well-founded after the ratification of the 16th Amendment to the United States Constitution in 1913, Congress implemented seven federal income tax brackets ranging from one to 7%. Now, by the time President John F. Kennedy called for tax reform in his 1963 State of the Union Address, the top marginal rate was 91%. Now, some would have you believe that a graduated income tax is the silver bullet to solving our massive public pension debt and crippling property taxes. But a state worth mentioning as a cautionary tale is New Jersey, as the state that our high property taxes are consistently second to, the Garden State's woes go back decades just like ours. And in 1966, in an effort to curb their high property taxes, the state implemented a sales tax. A decade later, still faced with high property taxes, New Jersey implemented a graduated income tax. Well, guess what? 
Here we are nearly half a century later and New Jersey still suffers under crippling property taxes, massive public pension debt, high outbound, high outbound migration, and a graduated state income tax. Now this, this greater tax power would simply allow politicians to avoid confronting the decades of poor public policy decisions that have destroyed our state. Now we do not think Illinoisans would be well served by granting the legislature greater latitude to levy higher taxes, and we're not alone. The Illinois Chamber of Commerce, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, uh, the Illinois Farm Bureau, and others have lodged their opposition to this. Recently, the former head of the Better Government Association wrote that politicians should first, quote, attack bureaucratic bloat and embrace serious ethics reform. And as the editorial board of the Belleville News Democrat uh, stated while this was uh, percolating its way through the legislature, quote, why in the world would state lawmakers be talking about a progressive tax if it were not a path to more of your money? So with that, uh, I'm very interested to hear what you think of, about this, what uh, Representative Swanson would like to add to the conversation, and then I'm very happy to answer any questions that you may have about it. Anybody have any questions? You might have to unmute your mic. Any questions? Oh, something. This was a good uh, presentation. I kind of wish I would have uh, videotaped it on my phone. Is by chance is it recorded so we can like send it out to people? Not this particular presentation, uh, but on our. Uh, Facebook page, which is No Unfair Tax. Uh, we've had quite a few digital events like this with uh, lawmakers and uh, and and others, and so um, feel free to feel free to look there. And I'm also happy to share it with you, uh, pass information along to you, or if anybody here is involved in a civic or social or other sort of uh, community organization that would be willing to have me to talk about this, uh, I'm happy to to go anywhere or, 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 or join people uh, through the marvels of modern technology. Can you say this is Facebook, no unfair income tax? No unfair tax. No unfair tax. Okay, because I'll send it out to a bunch of people so they can try and vote no. So thank, thank you. you. Andrew, I'm gonna pop up a slide here that has the, uh, if I can make this all work. Oh my gosh, where am I? I may not be able to make it work. What are you looking at? Um, Cause I might have it. This that I, that's not what I wanted to do. Now where'd everybody go? I've got this chart that I've made Is myself. Is this a bracket? Yeah, the brackets. Oh yeah, here, let me see if I can pull it up. Cause I've got some comments. Um, all right, hold on. Hold on, uh, Dan, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Oh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, how do I undo that? If you go to the bottom where it says share screen, do you have any options? Um, let me see. Share screen. Is that the only one you have? Yeah, that's it. Let me, I'll try this one more time. Um, there's Dropbox, OneDrive, Google Drive, Box, Advanced, Basic. I, I've done this before. Let's go to. Yep, there you go. Yeah, now we're, I want to get to my, my slide, though. Well, I can, I've walked through it here. So while well, I dig for it. Um, so what I wanted to share is the tax brackets that have been um, approved by the House, signed by the governor. Okay, let's, how, can, everybody, can anybody see this? Um, I don't even see it working now, but anyway, those tax brackets, um, I'll walk through them and kind of explain them too and highlight kind of what Andrew said too. So there are six tax brackets. The first one is zero to $10,000. 
And based upon, I believe it's the 2017 taxes, there were 1.7 million people who filed in that bracket. The new tax rate for that bracket will be 4.75. Now keep in mind today we're at 4.95, okay? But this tax bracket will be 4.75. For a family or for an individual filer, that's a, a savings of $6.67. Or for a family of two, of course, two fathers would be about $13. That's what their savings would be. So let's move on to 10, 000, the next bracket, it's $10,001 to $100,000. There's about 3.5 million people in that bracket their tax rate would be 4.90 for both a single and joint filer. The approximate savings to the individual filer would be $37.75. The next brackets, $100,001 to $250,000. About 730,000 people in that tax bracket, and that's at the 4.95 where we're at today. The savings is $64.46. Well, you say, well, how can there be a savings? Well, the first $10,000 is taxed at that 4.75, and then up to the next $100,000 is taxed at 4.90. So that's where you get the $64 savings. And now's where we really jump. At $250,001 to $500,000, 132,000 people, that jumps up to 7.75%. Up to the 350,000 pays 7.85%. So they, that tax group, pays an additional $3,500 in taxes. The fifth bracket's $500,001 to $1 million. About 44,000 people in that bracket, they pay 7.85% or an additional $14,554. The last bracket's $1 million, $1 million, $1 pays 7.99%. So that filer pays an additional $106,000. Now, just to add on to what Andrew said, those first three tax brackets accounts for about 6 million people, okay? The top three brackets, 188,000 people. And using just a simple calculation on my spreadsheet without adding any real fine numbers, if I raise the tax rate of each one of those tax brackets, 0.25, the tax group of the $100,001 to $250,000 generates $253 million just on that one tax bracket. The closest one is $100 million, and that's a million dollar plus. So my point is, if we raise the taxes on that lower zero to 10,000, the bottom three brackets, that generates about, uh, about 300, about $400 million. But if we, gener if we tax the others, the top three, a 0.25% or 2.25, it only generates about $200 million. So you can see the governor this year, his budget, he overspent by $6 billion. This tax is expected to generate $3.2 billion. So we know we're $2.8 billion behind the governor's desires and thirst. So he's gonna be looking for at least $2.8 billion. In all of our minds, it appears like the easiest place to go um, is either any of those lower three brackets. And when you look at the 7.75 difference from that 4.95, we're gonna start seeing what we call bracket creep. Pretty soon that 4.95 is gonna go up to five and a quarter. 575, five and a half, just a prediction. But the argument will be, well, there's still two points below that next tire bracket. So, and, and as, as mentioned before, you know, when we talk about the, that $2.8 billion difference, 
And we heard the treasurer say, the state treasurer Farrick say, that this would allow for easier taxing of our retirements. Um, at $2.8 billion, maybe it'll pick up quite quickly by taxing retirements. So, I mean, that's where we don't, um, we want to be one of the states that remains as a, a neutral retirement taxing group. So I'll, I'll open it up now for any questions, see if that generated any more thoughts. So, Andy? John, we see you're reading the TV guide there. <laughs> see you reading the TV guide. <laughs> any questions or comments? Turn your mic on and uh, feel free to speak up. Thank you. Dan, I just want to thank you and, uh, and, and our presenter for excellent presentation tonight. Um, the, the most troubling thing I think is there's a simple majority that would be needed to pass an increase. Anytime, you know, like, for the, this constitutional amendment to be submitted, if I remember right, didn't that take three fifths vote? Yes, sir. Both chambers. Yes, sir. And yet, would increase taxes every year, a simple majority. And isn't the balance right now 73 to 44 in the House, the Democrats to Republicans? Is that right? Right, 74 to 44. 74 Because one was vacant. Yeah. True. They can pass an increase and still allow quite a few of their members to take a pass on it or even vote no. Uh, and then they still have it with a simple majority, 60. If they have 74, in other words, 14 Democrats could vote no and it still pass. So it just the ease with which that could be passed. A 60, 60 votes or a simple majority is relatively easy to come up with. I mean, but that's the troubling thing to me. And I believe you said it in the presentation of the states that have uh, pro what they call progressive income tax. I can't think of anything progressive about it. It's regressive. Um, no other state, is that correct? No other state has it by simple majority. It takes a higher threshold. Am I correct on that? Uh, if, if, if that's not absolutely correct, it's, it's nearly correct. So we, we would be setting a, a new low bar for allowing tax increases in the nation. Yeah. But excellent job. Thanks for doing this, both yeah. of you. Thank you, Don. And you know, the, the, the biggest scare of that is we can target specific groups too. And like I said, it's uh, a simple majority could raise that tax on the $100,001 to $250,000 range quite easily, or any of the lower ranges. And, and one of the arguments, and that's only going to affect 730,000 people. That's not very many voters. Today, when we pass or bring, talk about taxes, it's affecting almost 6.2, 6.3 million people. And uh, so, so it, uh, it really drills down into uh, small numbers. But simple majority. Anybody else, any questions? Nobody? Uh, Lynn wants to know what are some ways we can educate our friends and relatives about these reasons to vote no on the progressive tax? Uh, Facebook question mark. Dan, you want to take a crack at that? Sure. First, I'll, I'll take a crack and, and absolutely we need to get the word out. And I think Andrew kind of highlighted some of um, some of the, the tools that he has in his toolbox of accessing their Facebook page or their website, but educating ourselves too to be able to talk to um, the folks. And today or yesterday, most everybody got a mailer from Jesse White on the tax as a blue piece of paper. Maybe somebody just threw it away. I think that's what we might've done, but I can tell you, there you go. And if you look at the question itself that's gonna be on the ballot, it was debated over an hour, just the question itself. And Andrew, do you have that question available there that you could read? I don't. I yes, I do. As it appears on the ballot, and as Representative Swanson mentioned, that uh, this was this was passed by the legislature again on a on a partisan vote. Uh, but the language 
that the proponents would like to see amended into the Constitution is not what will appear on the ballot. What will appear on the ballot is a so-called explanation of amendment, which was very helpfully written for us by the proponents. And uh, it's in your blue pamphlet there. Uh, but it, what will appear on your ballot at the very top of the ballot uh, will be a paragraph that reads, the proposed amendment grants the state authority to impose higher income tax rates on higher income levels, which is how the federal government and a majority of other states do it. The amendment would remove the portion of the revenue article of the Illinois Constitution that is sometimes referred to as the flat tax that requires all taxes on income to be at the same rate. The amendment does not itself change tax rates. It gives the state the ability to impose higher tax rates on those with higher income levels and lower income tax rates on those with middle or lower income levels. You are asked to decide whether the proposed amendment should become a part of the Illinois Constitution for the proposed amendment of Section 3 of Article 9 of the Illinois Constitution, yes or no. So it is the case that uh, if, you, if you want the amendment to become part of the Constitution, you vote yes. And if you do not want the amendment to become part of the Constitution, you vote no. But you, you, you can make the argument that the explanation is a bit misleading because it also, of course, allows the state greater authority to impose higher income taxes on lower income levels as well. And again, uh, the requirement that there be only one tax on income will be gone. And so it is absolutely a fact that the legislature could impose a separate marginal rate uh, on retirement income than uh, the rates that Representative Swanson mentioned and that I referenced, uh, which would apply to regular individual income. Thank you, Andrew. Any other questions? And I would say you know, to the point of you know, what can you do, uh, I think the, the most important thing that any of us can do is, is, is to feel empowered by this and view this as an opportunity. Uh, because unlike all those other tax hikes where we didn't have a say and we couldn't do anything about it, on this one, we do have the opportunity uh, to have a say and to vote no and to help educate people about why they should vote no, because you know, the, the, the legislature uh, didn't place this question on the ballot because they were curious to know what we think. The only reason that we get to vote on this is because they had to ask us. There was no other way to do this. And so this will not happen unless we allow it. And so really, again, view this as an opportunity and really feel empowered by this uh, uh, you know, this is the one time you get to actually vote no on a state income tax hike and help people understand that the 97% is only because the only reason they can say that is because of the last tax hike and there's no guarantee that these introductory rates will remain in effect for very long and the money's in the middle, like Representative Swanson was mentioning. Yeah, that's, I just caution everyone that the tax rate, if this passes, you will pay these rates for your 2020 income tax. I suspect when we get back in session this spring that those tax rates will change. Just pretty strong feeling. I've already talked about reasons why. Because of the um, spending, um, we're shooting behind a duck was an army term we used to use. Um, that duck spent $6 billion and we were only going to generate $3.2 billion with this tax increase. So the tax rates that, that you may pay if this passes would only be paid most likely only one year because the House and the Senate will take action to increase those rates. Would you agree, Andrew? It's just too easy, as, as Don and everyone has pointed out here tonight, too. Right. When, if the legislature has a choice between reforming the way the state does business and raising taxes, the path of least resistance is going to be raising taxes, right. especially when they can start to slice and dice uh, people the way that uh, Dan was referencing uh, with his chart. All of a sudden, 
this vote only is only going to raise taxes by a quarter of a percentage point on just the people within this range of income. And then all of a sudden, it's only going to uh, increase by a half a point on the people in this range of income. And so it, it, it just becomes this almost this, you know, drip, drip, drip of, of increased taxes on this group and that group. Um, and before you know it, everybody's paying more. Any other comments or questions? Anyone? Dan, uh, thank you for this uh, presentation. You really brought a lot of things to light here and Andrew as well. Uh, uh, I can't do much, but uh, we have a little coffee in our area, about uh, 16, 18 people on Tuesdays. And uh, I'm going to let them know how I feel about that and what you folks have presented. And uh, I certainly uh, feel like it's too easy for taxes to be raised uh, in the future. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Sounds like a sounds like a good group. I was talking to a a fellow that was telling me about a similar group of uh, men that get together for coffee in the mornings, and he's he called it the L and L Club, the Liars and Loafers. <laughs> <laughs> well, that might even progress some of the family members and uh, expand. So it starts small and enlarge. Yeah. Yeah, we just have to share that message. No doubt about it. Correct. So. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Appreciate that. Appreciate your comments. Anybody else? We've got a great opportunity here with Andrew, the expert. And I got a thing in the mail today from uh, the union. I work for the railroad, and the union has is endorsing this. Of course, I don't know what it is. The sickness of Democrats tax and spend. It's all. It's what it is. I don't know why they're doing it, but I want to try and do some posters and put it work let people know to vote against this thing and also text the people on my phone and and uh, I, I took a little video of your explanation of different rates and i'll be sending that out yeah. too as well but we had to beat this thing well i appreciate that derek and I, I appreciate i know we've got a couple farm bureau managers on here too and appreciate farm bureau's position on this you might see a lot of those red signs out there that say stop on them. Well, those are all Farm Bureau signs and uh, Farm Bureau's um, really high invested in this. And someone else that's extremely invested in this, believe it or not, is AARP. But it's not in opposition to it, it's in favor of it. Imagine that. Yeah, I think it's 450,000. 450, is that where they're at, Andrew? Or are they up to three quarters of a million now? No, unfortunately, right, AARP has donated a half a million, nearly a half a million dollars to the Vote Yes effort. Yeah, and uh, I am just don't understand because one of the groups that's going to be the most closely affected are seniors. And uh, I think AARP, and I'm not a, I, I better not go anymore there. So <laughs> we'll leave it at that. No, but I, I do appreciate all the work that the Farm Bureau is doing on this. Uh, they've been uh, incredibly helpful in, in, in their outreach efforts to their members uh, to help educate uh, uh, folks in agriculture across the state about uh, the negative effects of this. So to those of you on the call that are, invo that are involved in Farm Bureau, uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation and we are starting to see more of these signs out here. Uh, no vote, no vote. I'm glad to see that going up but Thank you for all the information. This just adds to what I might have already heard or knew. So thank you again. And Danielle, thank you for your comment too. That's what, when people ask me for signs, I refer them to the, the local farm bureaus. And uh, um, gosh, it's just, uh, it's great to see um, all those signs out there. And, and we know signs don't vote, but they surely send a message. And uh, numbers count. So, and thanks for your comments too. Sam, appreciate that. Anybody else? I see um, Melissa, uh, thank you. Jill is up at our Bureau County Farm Bureau. Um, if anyone needs signs, she has them. And Danelle is up at our Lee County Farm Bureau. She says, feel free to contact them. And uh, I know each of other county farm bureaus have signs. So feel free to reach out. Um, 
it's a heavy investment by our Farm Bureau, but uh, certainly we all have a, a leg in this to, uh, piece of the fight. So it, I think we're about wrapped up, Andrew, unless anybody has any other comments. Um, certainly want to thank everyone for participating in today's, tonight's um, Zoom conference. And uh, it's interesting new technology we've all learned over the last several months, but it's uh, it's a pretty darn effective way to, to reach out and talk to people. And uh, you may, uh, it, it's, you can see facial expressions for those who are, are online here. And for those who at least can listen in, we appreciate you joining us, but uh, just a new way of communicating. And uh, we'll maybe try and do some more here as we go forward. But uh, keep in mind, uh, we need to get the word out, share it with our neighbors and be uh, most productive and, and and talking to people. So once again, I want to thank everyone and uh, have a great evening. And uh, we'll be signing off here. Andrew, once again, thank you very much. Oh, thanks for having me. And I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you. Real good presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good evening and a safe harvest for the farmers out there. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Night, everybody. Bye-bye. I thought there was supposed to be one on the Constitution. <laughs>